real estate is about freedom, choice freedom, time freedom, and money freedom, and the impact you can make with that freedom. But it doesn't come without cost. Your freedom takes work. That's why Neil Timmons brings together the tools you need to build your real estate legacy, from tips and tricks to interviews with industry titans. It's all here in one place. Real Grit. Let's get to it. Hey, everybody, welcome to Real Grit. I'm Neil Timmons. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited. I'm here with the one, the only, the legendary John Martinez. John, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Good. Well, hey, uh, you, you're the legendary coach. You're the you're, the, you're probably the the man behind uh, tens of millions of dollars, and certainly in revenue. Um, you've been very impactful in this community, so I appreciate you taking the time to connect up here. Tell me, uh, you, you've been in sales for maybe, probably for your whole career at this point, but um, talk to me about how you how you got turned on to real estate, and um, let's just start there. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, it's kind of a funny story. Um, been in sales, worked my way up through corporate America. I ended up opening a sales training company, and the first year it was open we worked with dozens of different industries, nothing in real estate, but everything else, IT, manufacturing, insurance, you name it. Um, But then I was working with the local call center um, one day and they produce leads for realtors and investors. And uh, I I rewrote their scripts and did some basic training with their, their sales team. And they had called an investor and the investor they've been going after for a while. And he's like, I don't know what you've changed, but I love it. Sign me up. But the only condition is put me in touch with whoever is in charge of the changes. So I got connected with him. His name was Will Denker out in Houston, Texas. Okay. Um, and he called me. And so I just started chatting. He said, hey, here's what I do. He explained he was a wholesaler. Never heard of that before. Had no idea right. what it was all about. Yeah, my, yeah. my mind yeah. was blown. And he's like, will you come down to Houston and just work with my team? And I said, I'd I'd be happy to. So um, that's how I got sucked into real estate. And we had had a lot of great success with his team. He's in multiple masterminds, word spread. And within about three to six months, um, the REI side of things took over my business completely. We ended up shutting down the other uh, industries and just focused solely on real estate investment since then. Wow. What year was that? I want to say 2013, 2014, okay. somewhere in there. It's been a little bit then. Yeah. 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 What is, uh, what's maybe what's unique, if anything, about real estate, about selling the, you know, what it is that we do on the real estate investment side from a sales yeah. perspective standpoint versus, you know, another industry in which you would have worked in. Yeah. There, there's some, some drastic differences. The most obvious being, um, it's sales, but you're the one cutting the check. So the dynamic is different, right? You're trying to buy something, but it's still a sales process, uh, you know, walking someone through that, that decision. Sure. Um, so that's a weird paradigm. The other big thing is all sales is emotional. And to an extent, some industries, it's easier to get to, you know, the personal impact of a sale and the emotional side of things. Uh, but in real estate investment, it is spot on. It is all the sales are, for the most part, extremely emotional. Um, a lot of impact. It's a huge decision. Uh, a lot of sellers are distressed. So there's huge impact on their life uh, and, and, and the stress and stuff from, from that uh, perspective as well. So just the fact that you're cutting a check and that it's a deeply personal type of sale um, makes it pretty unique. Yeah. It's unique. Do you, in your opinion, do you think it makes it easier or harder due to that, um, let's, let's say, deeper emotional perspective that the, the counterparty is coming from? Yeah, so it's a more difficult sale than most other industries. Mm. Um, but what makes it possible is, I mean, because you got to think about it this way. Some people are giving up 30, 40 percent equity in their, in their house just for this service. So to say, hey, will you give me hundred thousand dollars to make this a little easier for you. Um, that's a, that's a tough sale, no matter how you cut it. Right. Um, the other thing that makes it tough is there's no shortage of people making offers. So you not only have to make your offer attractive, you've got to beat everyone else, uh, and get the deal done. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges that make it unique and challenging. Um, but the, the piece of it being so closely tied to, personal impact of whoever's selling the house, the emotional side of, of the equation. Um, that's what makes it possible. Yeah. 
what um, what's your take? Maybe maybe the better question is how do you think it's different, and how do you how does that sales process different when you're training uh, when the sales taking place belly to belly, and you know in today's world, tons of people are moving virtual when it's just being done over the phone. Yeah, so surprisingly, there's very little change. Um, obviously, with the, the whole COVID situation, we saw a major shift Correct. there. Yeah. And I'd say, you know, looking at our clientele, maybe 10 or 20% pre-COVID were virtual. Um, today, I mean, really immediately after that, that first month hit, it shifted to 80 plus percentage, and I'm estimating here, uh, of our clients are completely virtual or, or partially virtual, have some type of hybrid model. Yeah. So we learned a lot about the differences and, and the major lesson was it's the exact same conversation. Now, the conversation moves a little quicker over the phone than face-to-face. It's just the nature of, of not being with somebody. Um, the pauses are shorter, answers are quicker, things like that. So it, it accelerates the sales call, which is a unique challenge. Um, and the other thing is, you know, uh, the rapport building part, the tour of the property, um, an additional what we call deal killer or something that might get in the way of the sale is them believing that you can make a solid offer and put your best foot forward without ever seeing the house. So there's a couple of, of small, unique areas where you need to pivot just a little bit, but 99% of the sales calls the same. What do you think, doing this as long as you have, what would you say separates those the, the ultra successful in the business and the people you know let's say who 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 experience mediocrity yeah um that's a pretty simple one um you know if i look at uh, the easiest way to look at it is if i look at the the larger teams uh who do our training and the sales people on those teams and and, and who does better than the rest better conversion rates and, and things like that mm-hmm. Um, it's really easy to point out. It's just people who follow the process. Now we have a good sales process, but, but really that applies to any sales process or really any process in any wing of your business. Um, but the feedback, the overwhelming feedback we get is those who are the most successful, they don't try to overthink it. They don't try to um, force sales. They don't try to win people over with personality. They just follow the sales process. Um, the funny thing, the shift we've seen this last year and a half or so um, with a lot of the teams we work with is their most successful salespeople now, uh, conversion wise acquisition agents are not salespeople. They were people in an admin role or who they hired in from, from outside the company who've never been in real estate, never been in sales, but they just had the, the personality and the right fit for the company. And those are the most successful salespeople we see today because they, they have no bad habits. They don't know anything but to follow a process, a process. Um, and they, they have the most success. Historically, an admin person is better off at following a process than a historical salesperson. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, elaborate on process. When you say that, for for those who you know haven't been exposed to a sales process or don't know exactly what it looks like, could, could you ch- talk a little about yeah. that? Yeah. So when I talk about sales process, I really am just referring to what steps need to take place or what check boxes need to be checked. So if there is a closable deal, it actually gets closed. So you can really break that down into two categories, in my opinion. One category is the motivational side of things. Is there a reason for them to do business with you? How compelling is that reason? So diving deep into that and really bringing all that to the table is is one huge piece. Um, But even when people want to do business with you, a lot of investors and acquisition agents have have talked to very motivated people who they didn't get the deal from. Mm. The reason is the second piece, and that's the deal killers. There's things that can hold up a deal or or gum it up or cause it to stall or delay or or just kill it all together. So addressing motivation, making sure somebody has the uh, compelling reason to take action, and then systematically going through and uncovering anything that might get in the way and dealing with those things that to me is a sales process. Mm, okay. Tell me, um, you know, for, for somebody, you know, a newer, let's say they don't have an established team. They're, they're running, they are the salesperson. Mm-hmm. What, what are the top two or three things you, you know, you'd be advising them to, to do from a, from a sales perspective? Yeah. So the simplest things would be number one, ne- never lead with the offer. Um, 
offer want you want the offer to be the last thing that comes out of your mouth basically and then the negotiation so a very simple rule is hey you know if i was just if i had 10 minutes to train someone who's never yeah. done this before yeah. i'd say just talk to them for 20 to 30 minutes about what's going on get all the details learn everything you can about them and their situation and, and what they want and what they're dealing with and then make your offer uh, so, you know, that's going to force some conversation. You're going to uncover some of those things that could right. kill the deal or their motivating factors. And the more you talk about those, the more urgency people feel to, to do something about them. So just having a real conversation without worrying about getting an offer out as soon as possible would probably be my number one piece of advice. Yeah. Number two would just be mindset, which carries through to how you conduct the, the conversation. And the mindset has to be, I don't need this deal. I'm not desperate for it. I'm not going to try to convince them to give it to me. Um, and being okay with that and, and letting your, your seller know, hey, if this works, it's fantastic. If not, no big deal. I, I make a lot of offers. Sometimes it's a perfect fit, but not always. If it is, great. If not, you know, no biggie. Um, having that attitude really opens up the conversation, opens up the trust, again, allows you to uncover more of why they would or wouldn't do business with you um, and just puts you in a much better selling position. So those were the, would be the two top points of advice I'd give if I had, you know, maybe five minutes to train someone. That, that's how I do it. Yeah. For, the, for those who are more experienced, where do you see people typically falter when they do falter through the process? Is there one, yeah. is there one side of that, that process or part there of There is a, a blaring, a couple of blaring areas. Yeah. Um, the first one is going to be um, skipping over what we call deal killers just or objections, really anything that gets in the way of or slows down a deal. Um, a lot of times there's a lot of motivation and I see people get very excited and it sounds like it's a deal and they want to do something. But when it comes time to put pen on paper, it, it stalls out because even though there was a motivation, didn't take the time to step back and, and again, systematically uncover anything that might get in the way and deal with it. So when that happens and you fail to do that, you get to the end, reality sets in for the seller and they go, well, hold on, I want to do it, but there's some stuff I got to figure out. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's a lot harder to figure out what that is right. than earlier in the sales call. The other place I see uh, where there's a tremendous um, amount of, of improvement, uh, mm -hmm or that kills a lot of deals that, that don't need to be killed is the very end when you inevitably get some form of a, you know, let me think about it. Let me get back to you. Let me, let me, you know, whatever, talk to somebody. Um, not dealing with that the appropriate way, I think shuts down a lot of deals that otherwise with um, a different approach could be uh, really brought to fruition. So, and, and when I say that, it's just not accepting uh, uh, anything other than a yes or a no. And right. there's a very tactful way to um, force decision without putting pressure on anybody. And when you're able to do that, what happens a lot of times is, well, number one, if it is a no, you figure it out and that's good that you know exactly where you sit. Right. Number two, lots of times there's these deeply hidden deal killers. Now that you get to the end, reality again hits and they go, well, I got to figure out where I'm going to go and this, and I got to talk to this person. Right. Those things get uncovered and you could deal with them right now. And then sometimes people just go, hey, it's time to make a decision. I've dealt with this long enough. Let's just freaking do it. Right. So right. Um, those are the two areas, skipping deal killers and, you know, being too, um, just, just leaving uh, the end of a sales call with, with lots of, you know, I'll get back to you and let me follow up and, and that type of thing. Without a decision, without a yes or a no. Yeah. Right. Maybe, maybe it's not acceptable. Right. So over the course of last year, there's been a big shift, as you mentioned, uh, to to doing it virtually. One of the things that you know, in talking to to people in the industry, that that comes up that never came up when you were with person is you come to an agreement, you get a yes, and you send the document out electronically, and then you never hear from them again, right? Yeah. You get, that, that when you're with somebody in person, of course, that's a different. You, you know the answer. Um, yeah. So how do you, how does one deal with that? How do you contend with that? And, you know, yeah. and then, you know, that's one question is obviously on the back side of that, but you've touched on the front side of that as a whole yeah. bunch of, you got to get good at things on the front side to not allow that to happen. Meaning uncover those things that should have been uncovered to not, to not allow somebody to, to, there's obviously a friction. There's a reason they're doing this. And so maybe talk to me, you know, it happened. It's on the, you're on the back side of this. Uh, you've got some sequences and, and certainly some some text messages, some some verbiage that can go in place to get somebody to come out of the woodwork at some point. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a couple of points I want to hit there. Number one is just taking a second to really confirm the deal after it's wrapped up. Um, we call it pulling back. Uh, other sales trainings call it different things. But just after you think you have a deal, taking a step back and just, just testing it real quick and saying, listen, sounds like we're, we've got a deal, but I get the feeling we're not 100% there. Like there's still something on your mind or something that you haven't, I could be wrong, but something you still got to figure out before you're 100% confident. A little just tip like that will sometimes uncover those things that get in the way. Um, But after that happens, you've sent out the contract and you don't get a reply. Well, two things here. Number one, you want to be on the phone when you send the contract. Um, so usually the easiest way to set that up is, Hey, listen, there's going to be, it, it's a pretty simple contract. I never had anyone never had the, the contract stop someone from doing a deal with me, but it is a contract. So there's legal language. So, um, we'll hop on the phone. I'll send it to you via email. And I just want to go over some, some quick points there. So there's no confusion about how it's written. So just being there with them, yep. right. You're not in the same room, but at least you're working through that contract together. Yep. That's a, a huge tip. Now let's say, you didn't get the opportunity to do that and you just had to send it. And now you you think they're going to sign, but you haven't heard back. Um, the best thing to do is assume that they've decided no. We want to encourage them to continue the conversation in case there's some way we could turn this thing around. So making sure that they, they're not feeling pressure, that if they do talk to you, uh, if, if they feel like they're going to talk to you and you're going to say, sign, 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 why haven't you signed? They're not going to talk to you. They'll, they'll ghost you forever. But if they don't feel that pressure, then they're more likely to talk to you. So just by assuming the no and saying something like, hey, listen, I'm assuming that something's changed or, or maybe you did business with, with someone else or maybe it's just not a priority right now. Yeah. Uh, but I did want to reach out. And then there's there's a piece where you kind of ask for help and people are likely to, to give you that help saying something like, listen, I... My concern is that I, I might have goofed this up somewhere and and, and messed things up, um, and and uh, I'm kind of worried about that. That little uh, spiel, I guess, is is will get people to come back and, and crawl out of the woodwork because we've we've relieved the fear of, of them being hard sold, um, and then we've also people have a tendency to want to help other people. So you say, hey, listen, I'm struggling with this. I feel like I might have goofed this up somewhere. Did I did I really jack this up? Um, people will reach back out and go, no, 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 it's just that this, or here's what's going on. Or yes, I sold to someone else. And you just, at least you get that conversation going again. And if it can be saved, you now have an an opportunity since there's some, some dialogue. Yeah. That's one of the things I like best about you is that there, this is a no pressure process because pressure historically you end up in a fight or flee situation Mm -hmm. on the other side. And, And this is, this is about uncovering, you know, really what's going on, unpacking their baggage, figuring out what's going on, figuring out how you can apply your solution. But at the same time, knowing that sometimes you can't, sometimes what we do is not applicable to them. Right. And it's great to know that because correct. One of the things I see that happens to a lot of investors that are having more and more success is that means that they've had a lot of conversations and they end up with this follow-up list that gets hundreds or thousands thousands of people along. Yeah. And when you have that size of a list, you, you can't follow up with everybody. You, you, you don't know who you really should be following up with, who really is close to a yes and who's really a no. So you, you end up with this mess and you're not able to capitalize on, on follow-up leads you, you otherwise could just because the volume's too high. You're totally right about that. Yep. That, that is interesting because you're, you end up with way too much. And that is one of the biggest tactics is, is on the front end, it's going to be yes, or it's going to be a no. There are, there are no maybes, a, a maybe is a no. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Talk to me about, um, so you mentioned, um, you know, you, you help other people or help people like me in the industry. How do you help people? I guess, how, how do people plug in or how can they? Yeah. So we've got an online training platform called the REI sales Academy. And it's just a, um, it's a live weekly program where we go through a, a very sequential step-by-step sales process. I kind of think of it like, like paint by numbers, mm-hmm. right? Just you do this here, you do this here, you do this here. Um, and that, that training goes year round. People get access to it, uh, get lifetime access. So we've been working with a lot of teams for a very long time. Um, and we just go over our sales process and the soft skills you need to get through that sales process effectively, no matter who you're talking to or what situation you're in. And uh, we go through the 12 weeks and we start over and we do it again. So 
Um, sales, like anything else, is it's, it's the more you practice, the more you're even exposed to the right way to do things, the more you pick up and, and the better you get. So any type of sales training, um, really any type of training, I, I think needs to be ongoing uh, for a very long period of time or else you get a little bit of benefit and then you, you get, you know, uh, less and less over time. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's like working out and then stop working out. Right. I mean, you're, gonna, you're, going, you're going backwards. There's, yeah. there's no way around it. Hey, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot just a little. Talk to me. You get exposed to some of the absolute best teams in the country. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about from, from the outsider's perspective, looking in how, you know, the best of the best, what are their, what's their culture like? Yeah. Very open culture. Um, I would say the biggest thing that stick out to me would be um, it's a culture of accountability um, and a lot of personal accountability. Uh, when people goof up, they admit it. When they need help, they admit it. Um, you know, and, and that's just it. They, they know their, their flaws. They know where they've fallen short and, and they seek to address those things from the leadership down to everyone on the team. That's, that's the general culture of, of success that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, if you go the opposite way, um, you have a bunch of prima donnas on your team or something like that. What happens is if, if you can't admit that you can improve, you won't improve, right? If you can't admit that you need to improve, you're not going to take on any new training or do anything different. So you'll never get any better results and you're stuck. So that kind of attitude is just, just toxic. Um, you can't, you can't help somebody who doesn't want to be helped. So really just, you know, um, that, that personal accountability, that vulnerability to be able to admit when you are not where you want to be, that I think is what makes a great team. Yeah. Let's move on to uh, our final segment, what I call four yeah. for impact. Uh, your favorite quote, uh, screw it, let's do it. Richard, Richard Branson said it. Yeah. Why is that so impactful for you? Well, it's, it's, it's been personally impacting to, to my, my career and my life. Uh, I read that book um, right before starting my own company. And it just resonated with me and it, it was it repeated over and over in my head. And, you know, starting a, a business and leaving the corporate world was, was really tough. I had a lot of responsibilities and bills and all that kind of stuff uh, that everyone has. So it was really tough, but that just stuck with me. And every story in that book stuck with me. And I got to the point where I said, screw it, let's do it. And, and, and I've never looked back. And along the way, there's been big pivots and changes I've made in business. And every time you get to that point where a decision needs to be made and it's scary and there's some risk um, and you can either chicken out or say, screw it, let's do it. So that, that has carried me through, um, forced me to make a lot of tough decisions that um, the majority have really worked out for me. Talk to me about um, when you left the corporate career and went and did your own business. Uh, obviously, a number of us in this industry have done the exact same thing. There's a number out there, folks listening, who are you know have uh, one foot in each place. What was it, you know, internally that said I had to do this? You know, I was. Um, truth be told, I was depressed. I was miserable. I would wake up, and I remember mm. every morning I would wake up, and I think to myself. Like this is my life for the next 30 years. And there, there was nothing to get excited about because I was like, when I'm 40, when I'm 50, when I'm 60, yeah. Yeah. getting up, going through the grind, you know, this, this, and this. And I, I didn't see an end. I just thought I'm going to have to slog through this for 30 or 40 years. Then I guess I die. And to me, that was, that was depressing. There was no growth. There was no excitement. Um, and you can only have so many of those mornings before you, you, you make the decision, something needs to change. So for me, I just, I just wasn't happy. It just, there was, because there was nothing to look forward to, it just, um, it was kind of crushing. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think holds most investors back by back? Meaning, I mean, taking action, taking that leap, taking the next step, whatever, yeah. wherever they happen to be to go to rise to, the, to their next level. It's that fear. And, um, you know, when you talk about that, I have a different perspective than most. Most people are going to say, you know, it's what prevents people from getting into real estate investing or, or working for yourself. And that's very real. And that's true. But I see it in a different area. I work with a lot of, I mean, I guess you would say the most successful investors in the country, they um, by different metrics, but um, even with them, I see fear holding them back. They'll get to a certain point. Mm. 
Um, and sometimes you get to a point of success where now the fear is even greater because when you got nothing to lose, you got nothing to lose. Correct. But when you've got everything to lose, it gets really scary and it prevents them yeah. from taking additional risks and the growth. So I see a lot of people that rise and rise and rise and do very well. And then they just get stuck. Yeah. for years and years and years. And it's the same thing that keeps some people from getting into the business, mm -hmm. but it's just when you hit a level of success, it's, it's a whole nother ball game where, where now I can't give this up. No, no job is ever going to pay me what my bills are now. Correct. Um, and it, it's scary to continue to take those risks because you got more on the line, the, the, the more success you have. How does, does one break? How, yeah, it absolutely makes sense. Yeah. How does one break through? Yeah. Screw it. Just do it. Sure, just do it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. what you got to do. Right. Um, you know, I, I'd say my business stalled out for three or four years, successful, happy, yeah. but yeah. growth stopped. And I realized it was just because I was scared. So we've, you know, I've had to take some risks lately and, right. and do things to, to, to grow. And um, man, I've been a lot happier yeah. because of those things, but good, um, good, I, I think good. it's very real that, that fear of, of losing it all. Good. The good's the enemy of great. Yeah. Right. Outside of real estate, what are you most passionate about? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's the obvious family thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, personally, I just anything outdoors. Uh, I love to, I'm, I'm in Missouri. So yeah. floating rivers is a big thing around here. Yeah. Two or three day float trips, camping. Um, I do a little bit of hunting, not even because I enjoy hunting, but to go up into a yeah. deer stand and watch the sun come up. So just, yeah. just, really the basics, simple stuff, family and outdoors is what really keeps me going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what would you say, uh, what, what's your favorite way to make impact in the, in the community? Yeah. Um, impact to me is empowering others. Yeah. It's easy to give money or resources, but, um, giving opportunity and, um, some guidance for people to improve themselves is the big thing for me. So I recently bought some businesses and, um, you know, employing some people, giving them larger roles, taking risks on people in leadership positions, all that kind of stuff um, is, is extremely fulfilling and, and extremely life impacting for, for those on our, our team. So that I'd say is, is really where my focus is as far as impact is, is lifting others up just by giving them one an opportunity and then two the resources to, to take advantage of that opportunity if they've got it in them. Yeah. Well, I sure, you know, make it, you make a direct uh, significant impact in this community um, by, by what it is that you do and who you do it for. So for that, I'm, I'm, I, I'm appreciative of. So if any uh, folks want to follow you, they want to find you, they want to learn more about training, where can they, where, how can they track you down? Yeah, just look up REI Sales Academy. A website will pop up, a YouTube channel, uh, social media feeds, stuff like that. But REI Sales Academy is, is where you go. Great. We'll make sure we put it in the, uh, the link in the show notes here. Well, listen, I really appreciate your time. And thanks for, thanks for contributing as much as you do here. And I, I know the audience is grateful. Yeah, Neil, thanks for having me. You bet. Hey, for everybody here at Real Grit, I'm Neil Timmons reminding you that real estate requires real grit. I'll see you next time. If you like our content and want more, you can access it at realgritpodcast.com. You hear it guest after guest. Instinctively, you already know it. But let me call it out. The most expensive action is inaction. The real estate market is full of opportunities. You just need to uncover them. You can build a business that lasts for years, makes monumental impact in the lives of those that you love. It's not just about business, but about the freedom you get because of it. Have you ever heard the saying, if you want to go fast, go alone? If you want to go far, go together. I believe that partnering is essential. In fact, I partner with hardworking investors all the time. The point is that you can get a lot further with the right partner. Let me say it again, the right partner. If you've ever thought about partnering with anyone, or if you have a partner now, I encourage you to download my free Partner and Profit Guide, which includes the top five must answer questions to evaluate a profitable partnership. You can find it at www.legacyimpactpartners.com. I'll see you in the next episode.